Well, good evening, everybody. It's just one minute before seven, but we might as well get started. My name is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm one of the three founders of EdChat Interactive. Uh, the other two are Tom Whitby and Steve Anderson. I see a number of you in the room know Tom and Steve, and actually a number of you in the room have been here for EdChat Interactives in the past, and we'd like to welcome you back. Uh, I hope that you've been enjoying them and, and learning from them. Uh, tonight, we're going to be having a discussion with Adam Bello about, uh, about uh, problem-based learning. We're going to be talking with Adam Bello. Uh, in addition to being a, a noted keynote speaker and a social media thought leader, um, Adam is what we might call an edupreneur, or he used the phrase earlier today. Uh, he has three products out. Uh, Edutecker, which is a free, which offers uh, web tools for teachers, which is free. Uh, EduClipper, which is, allows you to pull together uh, content from the internet and share it with your with your classes and, and other teachers. And then we learned it, which is an iPad app, which really helps with with the transition to project-based learning. So I'm going to bring down these slides right now, and I'm going to bring Adam up. To the stage, and there he is. Welcome. Hey, thank you. Hey, how are you doing? Thank you, Mitch. I'm doing well. Doing all right. How about you? Yep. Good. Good. Um, well, as I mentioned, this is this is the first time I've ever had a double header, and so um, so it's exciting. Uh, we've never we've never through through various schedulings we schedule two events for the same day, and and um, and and it's pretty exhilarating. It's 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 cool to see them work out, as I'm sure you do with with all three of your products. I yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> definitely have that, and you even have some return participants. You have Chris is back for more, and uh, I don't know if Terry was there before, but there's a bunch of people that are re repeat offenders. <laughs> yeah. So um, so basically, what have you been up to this summer? Um. Well, after ISTE, uh, it's kind of slow for me, which is really nice. I've been really focusing. We're doing a lot of work on EduClipper in particular. We've been building a whole bunch of new feature sets for EduClipper. Um, so that's kind of what takes up most of my day, and then hanging out with my kids at night, that's enjoying nice. this hundred hundred degree weather. Right. right. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull myself down, and I'm going to pull your slides up, and then sure. you'll just tell me when to advance slides, and um, and I and I know that there's going to be a time where there's going to be interaction, and uh, you'll just clue me in. Okay. Sure. Talk to see you later. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Mitch. All right. So. I mean, this is definitely, for those of you that have been on a shindig experience before for EdJack and Interactive, uh, you know the drill. We're going to, uh, you know, you see the slides up there. I'm going to talk about the slides, um, and then you'll be able to, please feel free to raise your hand at any point and, and chime in. Because the one thing I want to tell you to start with, you know, PBL means different things to different people. So Mitch, go to the next slide for me. Um, so PBL, like, you know, when you hear the term, it kind of conjures up, like, oh, everyone says project-based learning. Um, and I think it's morphed recently, in the last mm, five years or so, I felt like the term has kind of changed and, and meant different things to different people. Um, so we can go to the next slide. That P is really the one that changes, right? So I've heard project-based learning for years. You know, I've heard that for, for probably the last 15 years that I've been in education. Um, more recently, I've heard problem-based learning. Uh, talking about more, putting more ownership on the student designing a project based around a problem or solving a real world problem through the inquiry process. And then I like this last one also, which is passion. And I think that, you know, when you go, you talk about Minecraft, you talk about the maker movement, you talk about any of these things that are kind of the new resurgence of the, the hands-on experiences in education. And I feel like a lot of that is linked directly to the fact that people are passionate about uh, about what they're learning. So that's kind of, kind of the, the, the three P's you can look at. And I'm sorry, you, sir. So, uh, uh, sorry, the, the previous slide, if you don't mind. There you go. So PBL is defined by Buck Institute uh, for Education, which, by the way, if you're not familiar with the Buck Institute, they are probably the uh, preeminent you know, project-based leaders in terms of that they run PBL World, and there's a, just a wealth of knowledge on their site. So definitely check them out. Um, but they define it as a systemic teaching method that engages students in learning essential knowledge and life-enhancing skills through an extended student-influenced inquiry process structured around complex, authentic questions and carefully designed products and tasks, which is quite a mouthful. 
And, and more importantly than it being quite a mouthful, it's a lot to kind of wrap your head around. Um, a school that is, that is well known for doing a project-based learning approach is the Science Leadership Academy. And if you can go to the next slide, I have one of my favorite quotes by a buddy of mine, uh, founding principal Chris Lehman. He says, if you assign a project and you get back 30 of the exact same things, you're not assigning a project, you're assigning a recipe. Okay, I hope there's been some really spirited discussions. And actually, you know, I hope there's been some disagreement because it's out of differences of opinion that we all learn more. So let me bring up Adam here. And so Adam, uh, you, you got to talk yes. to some of the people. What, you know, actually, you know something, so I, I had an example because you brought up math and I, I was silenced because you were you were up here. But my, um, my kids, when they were in kindergarten, they both ended up having the same kindergarten teacher who had what I thought was one of the greatest math projects for kindergartners, which uh, she, you know, she would say, she'd just kind of pick up a number, like, let's say 12. They said, I want you to draw a picture where there's 12 legs, and I want you to have cows and people in the picture. And then the, the kids would be drawing a picture. And, you know, that's, it's not a, a, a huge thing, and it's certainly not difficult for a, um, a fifth or sixth grader. It wouldn't be what I would call a problem-based learning for, you know, an, old, an older student. But I always thought that was such a great math problem for younger kids. And even when the kids got it wrong, she would call the kids up and she would say, explain it, count the legs. And, you know, they would very often come, oh, I only have 10 legs, maybe. And it was like, well, how would you make it 12? And, oh, maybe I'd add another person. Well, why don't you do that? And they come back. It was, I thought that was a great project. That's so, very, very cool. Yeah. So I, anyhow, what would you talk about with people? So I was actually, we were talking with Julie and with Terry, and we were hearing, so, you know, uh, Terry's a library media specialist, and Julie's a, a technology instructor or technology training specialist. And, you know, it was interesting. We were kind of conferring that, that math sometimes is problematic, Julie was saying, and she's heard that, it's, you know, that causes some issues. Uh, I got to share a story that, I had worked with a math teacher last year that on our platform had assigned something. It was, it was definitely more of a project where it was prescriptive, but the project was um, there's a student in the class that's blind, and we'd like you to create a calculator. So you have to make a calculator. They were using, some kids used Arduino, some kids actually just programmed it online, and they made a calculator, so they had to teach all the math functions, but they used it with Braille or in the computer version. I think one of them used Scratch, and it had voiceover for where the numbers were so that this blind student could use a calculator. So it involved like a real world problem, and then it involved them learning a skill, and then of course executing it in a variety of different ways, which I thought was really interesting. Completely math-based um, mm -hmm. and computer science, but really just a, a fabulous way to, to kind of wow. break that cliche of like, oh, math doesn't work for PBL. So did you have anybody that you wanted, uh, that you specifically wanted to bring up? Well, I think Julie, I, Julie, if I could put you on the spot, because I actually said that Julie had left before, but she was right there. So I'm going to pull Julie up, because I want her to talk about, specifically, she was talking about the procedural versus, you know, the, the other types of learning. And I thought she said it really eloquently in terms of where she's seen things, uh, PBL, be more effective. And then if anyone wants to raise their hand and weigh in, uh, you know, about math or other subjects, because I think that other, obviously you have expertise in other areas. So Julie, come on up. Well, Terry was in our group too, so can can we hear you, Terry? Excellent. I hope so. Yep, you're good. So I'm just a teacher librarian um, at the elementary level, and just really uh, beginning um, with this um, idea because um, I really need my staff to be on board and uh, to be able to collaborate with them because I just see the kids, you know, an hour a week, and it's hard to get, you know, a project accomplished in just an hour a week. Um, so I'm just really kind of here gathering more information that I can take back and hopefully um, convince um, a teacher, you know, let's choose one of your areas and um, try to do this. Well, you know, it's interesting you talked about timing, because timing, and we're going to talk about that later, is like one of the biggest challenges of all. Um, a lot of the work can be time shifted because I think that if you have a student really engaged in what they're doing, which is the whole piece of student ownership, right? You will get a kid that is just dying to go home and work on this more. 
Uh, and I know that sounds strange, but I know that in my experiences, the pro one of the projects I did when I was an English teacher was the students had to create a soundtrack to their life. And they had to pick songs that, that signified moments of their, you know, their life. And they would write a, the liner notes basically explaining what the story was. And then they would put together this book and we would have them read it with the music in the background and all that stuff. And, you know, it wasn't necessarily a problem-based, but it was more of a project-based experience. And the kids that did that assignment, A, they remembered it seemingly forever. I have Facebook friends that, I, you know, I were my students 10 years ago and are saying, oh my God, I remember that assignment. And also, I know that they spent so much more time than any other project I would give throughout the year at home. You know, it wasn't given in, in, allotted in class. It was more like, you go do this. So I think a lot of the kids, if they get excited about what you're doing, they'll find the time outside of the class. So you don't have to worry about that. just that period being the one the chance to get to work on it. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Irby, yes. what's up? So, so I'm an instructional designer with the federal government, and the first question people ask me is, what the heck are you doing here? You know, I'm an <laughs> educator again of a different stripe. But uh, with respect to PBL, see, I, I support, I develop training mm -hmm. for clinicians, you know, doctors and stuff. And so for me, it's it's not enough, you know, to, to help them help them learn, you know, whatever they're going to be doing, right? Uh, it's to minimize to do that while minimizing their time away from patients. You know, it's all, it's all about you know, <clears throat> sir, you know, with the different panel sizes, you know, the patients that they see and so on. Uh, you know, they're, they're, the value for them, of course, is you know, face to face with, with patients. But maybe the stuff that I've learned at Ed Camps uh, that, that I go to and then Q events and so on is all about you know, engage them with a the story. You know, this is the situation. Ideally, you know, to to connect it with a person. Um, mm -hmm. And for some reason, for some reason, people identify really, really easily with bad things. So this patient has this problem, and it's really bad, right? And then to give them like, like, like the nutshell, you know, five minutes. This is the, the technique, or this is the process, or this is whatever you're going to be learning. And then to give them time, scaffolded time with the facilitator to either collaborate with with, with each other with several doctors at a time facilitated, you know, so they, if there's any problems, you know, they, they're not going to go down a rat hole and stuff and get lost and waste time. Uh, and then to kind of give them more time or more, yeah, I guess more chances to practice it. And then to give them what we call an action required so that as they have time during the course of the, their days, uh, that they produce something and then feed it back to the group, like in a, within an internal blog or email back to the facilitator. So yeah, I think PBL, as I, as I learned it from Bitcamp, uh, I think it has a, a lot of promise. Absolutely. I mean, I, that feedback loop you just touched on is so important. And it's one of those pieces that can get lost, right? The assessment side of things, how do you assess whatever. The feedback loop is so vital to kind of growing. Otherwise, you have them do work, and then you get a stamp of saying, all right, it's done. You get, you know, this is what we thought of it. But if you're able, able to go back and forth with peers and colleagues and people that are expert in that field as well, you know, in schools, you have to look at it as an opportunity to connect with so many other folks. Um, it doesn't have to be a time consuming thing. It could be let's hop on a shindig or Google Hangout or whatever it is and, and connect and, and share out what you're doing. I know Dom Wetrick is um, you know, using Periscope and, and a couple of other people that, that live near me are using Periscope to kind of broadcast their student pro, uh, performances, their, their, their end of year project or collaboration, 20% time you know, culminating project. And I'm able to watch them and ask questions and comment. And, you know, as, as a quote unquote expert in whatever field it is, you can get people to do that. It's, that's very, very important. I like that. That's really cool. Thank you for sharing that. So I'm curious, did, did people come up with subjects other than math that aren't good for PBL? And and math, you know, you came up with some projects all that that you could use for for PBL. But did, did people come up with with um, different subjects that for for uh, would it, passion based learning or problem based learning? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So did 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 have you heard of any or what? Oh, your I didn't. I didn't. I did not hear any from. From the crew, okay. so I, I, the people I was talking to, math was the was the subject that we were talking about. Um, it in my experience with this, 
you know, I have not seen a particular subject area where you cannot make this work. Um, I think some it's, it's a lot harder than others, and I think more of that comes from the fact that the people doing it, the teacher or the facilitator, are, are more stuck in the way of like, oh, I have to teach it in this way. Uh, or the objective is them understanding the concept rather than experiencing how to get the concept of work in a practical fashion. So, yeah. And I think that a lot of them, even the math projects, if you, if you look at that, they're really going to be cross-content projects because maybe you'll do a math project that has to do with demographics or people or, or, or something or maybe, maybe having to do with STEM. So mm -hmm. pure math projects may be rarer than math projects where the math is integrated into something else. Well, that's what I love about this. You know, what I love about PBL is that it can really cross curriculum. Um, it, it, it epitomizes the ability for us to do cross, uh, cross collaboration and curriculum. I know that, um, what is it, New Tech High, I think that their math and English classes as the, and their science and social studies classes, if, if I'm correct, those are the two that they pair up most frequently in terms of a, a block to do a project. Um, but they use those two skills and then they create the projects around those two things, which, which I find fascinating. Okay. Now, okay. Now the other thing is, I, I guess you have some more slides and um, maybe I, I should do. come down and let you, let, let, let you run through your presentation. Sure. Well, we'll go through these pretty quick. So the, the next slide, um, is just it's another question and maybe we'll do this a little differently so the, the slides is going to go up there and uh, it, it's the slide that basically asks the question is there a right age to start PBL with students and you know what I think just for the sake of time let's um, let's do the following let's do this as a hand raising question and if not Mitch will pick on two people that we haven't heard from yet so feel free to raise your hand. Do you think there's a right age, so to speak, where you would start doing PBL with students? Um, I, I have thoughts on this, but I want to hear from you guys. So instead of breaking up into groups, you may be in groups already talking about it. That's fine. Why don't we do one or two hand raises from here, and then we'll go to the next part, which is a question. So Edgar's talking. Hey, Edgar, how are you? Good. How are you guys doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for uh, popping in. Sure, no problem. I'm just trying to catch as much as I can. We're, uh, I'm a high school principal, and we're trying to start PBL as a school-wide this year. So That's I'm wonderful. trying to read up, do some research. But uh, so I got a lot, you know, trying to, we're trying to jump in, just jump off the cliff and, and see, what, yeah. see what happens. That's what you got to do. You, you know, you'll see a slide in a second that basically says that's, what, that, that's, that's the biggest thing, right? So high school principals. So high school, I mean, that's definitely, you know, I think there's no question that by high school, project-based learning completely works, right? I mean, the kids are older. They're able to handle more of the independent work. Um, certainly they have more identified passion uh, in certain areas. It's easier to kind of have them have that autonomy. Um, any guess as to, you know, when you would start? Like if you had the whole district to work with, when you start doing yeah, start a grade or yeah. I don't think I don't think there's an a, I think in any grade. I mean, just knowledge I have and what we're trying to do is just learning by doing. I mean, that that's kind of what I get out of it. So I I don't think there's a specific age you should start or not. In my opinion, I, I think sure. you roll it all the way down to you know. Absolutely. When do they do projects? When do they do projects? Kindergarten, volcanoes, you know, all those different projects. <laughs> I mean, they do that. All Already, right? So it's true. I don't think there's an age or, or a, a correct grade. Is we they do awesome. projects yeah, at no, all levels. That's true. This can be this can be scaled down depending on how you implement it. I I believe as well to to work on all levels. Is there someone else that has a differing opinion? I mean, feel free to raise your hand if you do. Um, you know, for me, there you go. I think that PBL, the biggest areas of pushback comes in these three areas. It takes too much time, it's difficult to manage, and it's difficult to assess. And I think that those are, those are the things that stop teachers specifically, but also districts from really an understanding of implementation. Um, and, and the truth of the matter is, it takes different skill sets, right? It takes a slightly different approach to running a classroom 
to implement PBL effectively. And I think it all comes down to, next slide, all comes down to workflow. Uh, it mentioned you run to the next slide. So workflow is basically how you're getting the PBL to, to function, right? How, how do you run a project in your class? How do you run uh, you know, a, a passion-based experience in your classroom or in your school? Um, and, I, and I think that this is a question as opposed, oh, let's go back one more. This is more a, of a question because I really would like to know for those of you doing PBL, what is your workflow? Meaning, you know, how do you set up the project? How do you go through the process? Every single person that I know that's doing PBL is doing it slightly differently. I think they're all doing it the same. If you look at the different ways people are implementing this, it, it does vary. So for the, those of you that have done PBL already, what is the workflow? In the basic steps of setting up the project, managing the project, and then how is the project assessed? So, and just, I know that's a, that's a meaty question, but if you can give us, you know, like a one minute answer of what, what gets done, how do you manage that, and then how do you assess it? That would be really helpful. So I'll give you two minutes to talk to each other, and then you can come together as a group and we can report from maybe one or two people, and then we'll move on with the presentation. Okay, we are back. Um, <laughs> so I actually was involved in a, in a conversation um, between Carissa and Irby uh, and Cindy and Edgar were in there as well, or, or Cindy was in there and then Edgar just joined. So we were talking about workflow and I think that, you know, one of the things that Chris was saying, in fact, you know, Chris, why don't, why don't you come up and talk about the project that you were just describing, if you don't mind, uh, but that's, I'm sure she's heard that joke before. Um, so I did a project with kind of three mini problems with similar steps, and I tried to break it down so they did like step one with all three problems and then brought it to class and compared work with each other. And I tr did that with the first step, and it just took so much time, I couldn't continue it with the next step. Yeah, I, I think that, like, the breaking up of steps makes a lot of sense. But I think it's like, do you feel like the steps were too big, or you feel like you everyone in lockstep in terms of finishing a, a step at the same point was the problem? Or what do you think, like, the actual buckle was? Part of it was lack of participation. I didn't have enough students come in with the work done. Oh, really? So you think giving them more time, like spacing them more, would have been better, or you feel like it just wasn't something that they were going to do? Uh, I, did, I don't think I got that buy-in I needed. Sure. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, without the buy-in, it's really tough, because you ask more for them from a work standpoint, right? Like, a kid can whiz out a worksheet, whether they do good or bad, in five minutes. You know, they'll write an essay, they got that pad as a formula. Doing a project where they have to actually think and invest themselves of time and, and mind, I think it asks a lot more, which is the really great part about it, but it also asks a lot more. And if you don't have that buy-in, um, so I'm putting you totally on the spot here, but like, how do you think getting that buy-in, like how, if you did it again next year, like what would you think of doing differently to kind of garner more of that buy-in? Is it changing the project or something else? Um, I think I would maybe focus on the end product and say, because there was a lot of creativity in the end. Mm -hmm. But along the way, they're doing a lot of boring math. So giving that, and that in the end, they're going to be able to create their own model and be, you know, use their own ideas and creativity with it. What was the grade, if you don't mind me asking? Like, was it a specific uh, grade level? Freshman in high school. Freshman in high school, so ninth grade or so? Uh, it, was, it was algebra, so I had, yeah, okay. ninth grade. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Very cool. Well, thanks for sharing. So, Mitch, I'll come back up now. We'll go through some more slides. So, so I think that, that, you know, workflow is really important. Um, the one thing that I hope that those of you that are listening to this that, that haven't started, because it feels like we're at different points. Like some people are just starting, figuring out how to start. Um, you know, I, I loved hearing that, that you're kind of starting this in your high school, right? Like that, that, that's one of those things that you're going to get going this year, which I think is great. Um, uh, I guess that maybe it was Edgar that was sharing. So 
I love that. And I think that the real truth is it doesn't matter if you start small. It doesn't matter if you start with one project, but you just have to start. Because once you start doing this, you'll see where it goes wrong, and it will eventually. It's just too big of a shift to really have it perfect the first time. But I think that the things that go right about it, which is really a large part of it is student buy-in and engagement. If you, if you, you know, can get it the right way, if you have the right group of kids and you're doing the right project, and as I said, you might not at first, but just start and then you tweak it over time and you can expand it to different areas of your curriculum or to really become a true project-based uh, experience as your entire class. And I think that that's kind of obviously, a lot of the people have that as a goal to do that. So, I, you know, I think our time is, is nearing an end over here. Um, I wanted to kind of, you know, take questions if you guys have questions. Um, if not, if you want to stick around, I'm happy to share a little bit about we learned it and how it kind of addresses some of the needs. But I didn't want to make the the hour that we had together as a commercial. Um, so I, you know, I didn't want to I didn't want to focus on a product to kind of do this workflow. But if you're interested in that, I'm happy to go through that. I have a whole bunch of slides to go through kind of like what we've done and how we address PBL as that workflow. So let's do let's do this first. Raise your hand if you have any questions about anything we've talked about so far or something that you wanted to know about that we haven't even broached. Uh, and then if once that's done, we can do, uh, for those of you who want to stick around, I can go talk a little bit about we learned it and how it might help you with PBL for, for the coming year. Julie. Can you hear me? Back with sound. Yes, I can hear you. Awesome. So going back to my um, initial conversation with you and Terry, when I when you asked about what 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 intrigued me and what made me um, want to participate, my question was um, easy PBL. Yep. So so in thinking about that um, as the session title, um, what would you say? Um, I guess I didn't catch the easy part. Uh, sure. Um, this video chat, and so I'm just curious. In your mind, what what would you say are the are the easy parts about it? Um, and maybe maybe I missed it too because I was doing some troubleshooting. You, you definitely did not miss it. You definitely did not miss it. The the bottom line is that doing a PBL as a shift from traditional model is not necessarily easy. I think that there's a couple of things that make it easier, and this is some of the things I was trying to get across before. So some of the things that I think enhance or or, or make it slightly easier are looking at the key components and focusing on that for your first year. So the first of which is student ownership. Um, not being prescriptive in a project, saying, you know, a lot of people that do PBL try to do like, everyone's going to do, you know, this project and everyone's going to do the exact same thing and we're all going to come up with, you know, uh, a widget or whatever. Um, a lot of times it becomes too prescriptive and you're basically just doing like a traditional project. Um, I think that that's, you know, like what, what Chris would call a recipe project, right? The other piece of it is authentic audience. A lot of times PBL, they don't find that audience. Um, there's not enough of the feedback piece, so it's kind of a double-edged sword. I think that the easy part of it is to look quickly to a, PB, or a PLN, rather, to look to Twitter, to look to Periscope, to look to wherever, to bring in an authentic audience, because I think it actually, both from the student participants as well as from the teacher, you get more people giving more feedback more readily. I think that that's kind of an easy way to tap a community that, that is very willing to do it. The same way you have blogs that have comments for kids and you get thousands of comments from, from educators around the world, you can easily do the same thing with PBL. It's not just about like a teacher giving her feedback because that becomes arduous. And I think that's a lot of the times people with the assessment piece don't know how to do that, right? Like, do I, as the teacher, have to be the expert in all of these projects and figure it out? The answer is no. The answer is you can kind of outsource some of that to the experts out there. We had just, so Tom Whitby just joined. He's an expert. He would love to weigh in and tell your kid what they're doing uh, and, and give some feedback. And I think that that's kind of the valid piece of, of looking at, at some of the ways to make it more easy and accessible. But you're right. There, there is no easy answer. It's a big change for people that have been doing things traditionally. And to start with, I always liked the advice of starting small. So I liked what Carissa was saying about the, I think, breaking a project into steps. And maybe, again, like she said, she had a hard time last year picking the right steps and the right timing. I think that that very well could be the case. So 
we have to kind of truncate and find the right uh, the right blend. Um, but again, it's not easy, and and it maybe the title was misleading almost intentionally because the reality is, you know, it's like easy exercise, you know, like seven minute abs or whatever. You know, it, it is a shift, but it's well worth it for those of us that that are either experiencing it or know of of some of the byproducts of of what goes on with PBL. All right, thank you. Yeah, sure. Great. I can't hear you, Edgar. Are you muted? How about now? Aha! No? There you go. No, you're good. You're good. Okay, great, great. Uh, I just had a question. Um, as I shared, I'm, you know, we're just jumping in, and, and I'm kind of being the driver at our school, but, uh, you know, I get a lot of a lot of questions, you know, from teachers, um, and as I'm trying to learn and stay current and, you know, just trying to be that, that driver, but at the same time have answers and, and make people feel comfortable about taking baby steps and, and making this PBL change. So I think this is what can really be the, you know, the difference maker. I think it would be a game changer in just the way, you know, how we educate kids, kind of how you talked about, you know, your son and bringing homework down and, so I'd like For to sure. go, you know, school-wide, and I'm actually being a little uh, ambitious and having all teachers, requiring all teachers to come up with one project that That's everybody great. does That's in great. one year, just one, just one project. But the question I have um, and questions that teachers are asking me about is, is the driving question or the challenge. You know, there's a lot out there uh, and, and a lot to pick from. And, you know, there's pro sample projects, different places. You know, the Buck Institute has a lot of stuff that, that we've, you know, been on and looking and and uh, trying to get teachers some sample idea. Um, sure. But some teachers, uh, you know, are kind of stuck on that driving question. Uh, what should that driving question be? And should there be, you know, the first time out, should I should I have should I create that question for the class, or should kids have options? Because I know the ownership's a big piece. You talked about that ownership being uh, big piece for high school. school. Uh, yes, high school. The ownership being more of how they display or produce the work. Um, so ownership sure. could be also somewhat in the driving question in a way. Um, so, you know, anything that you could share with me about. Um, selecting and, and making teachers feel at ease about sure. picking the right so, question, the wrong question. Absolutely. So there's a couple ways to do this. And I think uh, another resource that I didn't talk about that is one of my all-time favorite resources, Edutopia. And there's a tremendous, tremendous wealth of information on project-based learning with specific examples of projects. It's not set out in the sense that you're going to grab it and do that project, but it's like they kind of detailed the sum of the project. So edutopia.org, if you haven't been there, an incredible resource. I love the fact that you're you're putting the feet in the fire and saying do a project. You're not mandatorily saying everyone has to do all their projects that way. I love that. So just going back on that. Uh, in terms of the uh, you know the challenge question, it it really people have different thoughts on this. In my way of thinking, I like letting the teacher choose. Do they feel comfortable creating a challenge question? Because if it's a, if it's a crappy question, you're not going to get great projects. But if you're like Carissa and you could identify where there was a, a, a stop gap and in, the, in the actual teaching or setup of the assignment, you could be much better next year. And I love having that authentic, you know, the teacher also has more buy-in if they create the question. If you take a stock question, it's not a bad idea, but you will have more of a like, oh, uh, am I sure I'm doing this right? On the other hand, you'll have the network of people who created the questions perhaps to go back and, and commiserate with and kind of say like, oh, you know, would you mind taking a look at this project and how do you assess it? It might be easier first time around for the teachers that are not ambitious enough to go through it. I don't think you have to say it's all or nothing. I think you can kind of leave that up to the teacher in order to do that. There are banks of questions. Buck Institute obviously has banks of questions. If you just Google around, you'll find banks of questions. In, in We Learned It, we're actually developing banks of questions also for teachers to share. Um, because I think that sharing those projects, it does take time to kind of come up with a really good one and fine tune it. So, you know, it's not a complete answer for you, but I think that, that you're doing the right thing. I'll let them do either. 
And I also would allow them, since everyone's doing it their first year out, you don't want to cause animosity in the staff, but I would definitely take a few minutes at whether you do faculty meetings or quarterly meetings to have them share their experience so far. So not necessarily for you to highlight and exalt one person, but to let them commiserate and say, like, what were the challenges you faced? Because I guarantee you some of them will be able to, you know, workshop their own problems, uh, you know, if not pushing them to Twitter and other places where they can actually work with people that have done this before. Sure, sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm excited to see what you guys do. Hopefully, to share it out. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to. I mean, I think one thing I raised to Annie a little bit. I told him that uh, I want to um, take the best projects and then possibly uh, submit a proposal uh, to like ISTE and do like a do's and don'ts. So, kind of giving them uh, the teachers, not only the students, but giving the teachers an audience and say, hey, you're going to share. You know the challenges and what you learned, and but on a on a pretty big scale, and said, awesome. "Hey, this is what we want to do. We want to, you know, what I mean, we want to." And that's kind of what, kind of the motivation piece is like. Hey, man, we're we're doing this to, to learn and to change the way we educate and then share. And so that's you know, awesome. It's, I, I'm trying to pull all stops. I'm trying to tell them all expensive pay to Hawaii. Maybe maybe that'll work. I don't know, but <laughs> no, I I, I, so. I love it. I love it. That's great. So, that's really, really cool. But thanks for, thanks sharing. for sharing. I think you, uh, Adam, I think you might be doing some work with uh, our district, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, Joe Wister out in Arizona. Uh, in a small yeah, district. yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that's our district. That's our district. Oh, very cool. Yeah, so, very, very cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so great. So I appreciate it. I appreciate your oh, please, info. My pleasure. Thank my you. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so if you don't want to learn about it, that's totally fine. Um, but I will go through it quickly because I prepared the slides, so why not, right? Um, so we'll, we'll skip to skip forward and skip again. So the description is really, you know, at its core, we learned it's a, plat a learning platform that enables teachers to create and share dynamics, leave meaningful feedback on student work, and allow students to capture and track their academic growth over time in learning. Uh, portfolios. So essentially over here, we're, we're helping teachers create assignments. You'll notice in the bottom left, it allows you to have feedback from peers, feedback from other teachers, and then also as a teacher creating a project, you can add this assignment or project into this public library. So that was a question that Edgar had before, like where do you get uh, assignments? Teachers can actually take this and create it as a project. So the type of feedback that they get on the right hand side, those three icons are text feedback, which is your standard typing to someone audio feedback and video feedback because I know as a former English teacher when I was had to give written feedback my 35th or 100 student did not get as good a feedback as my first five or 10 or 20. Um, so next slide. The feedback that we look at from teachers are the following. So teachers get to leave they they leave feedback that is traditional grades because some schools just need a traditional grade to go along with it which is a culmination right. We do badging so we allow students, so that younger students can get badges. As I said, we do audio, video, and text feedback, as well as having a rubric. And the rubrics that teachers create can be shared. So next slide. So we give students a platform to complete their projects on, get feedback from their peers, and track their work. This is a portfolio example. This is a, a portfolio that a student would create of their best work to share it both socially. You know, they could put it out on Facebook and Twitter or whatever if they are old enough to do those things. They could get comments from other people on their work, and it's just not not just the people in their class. It's people that use our platform. There's about 300,000 people using the platform, and they can publish it to be public again, as I said before, as well as skin it to make it look uh, however the kids would like to. So uh, next slide. Uh, those are kids using it. Next slide. <laughs> uh, next slide. Next slide. I put in a lot of extra slides over here. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, next slide. Sorry, Mitch. I'm going to keep you busy with your fingers over here. Uh, so you can use a default rubric, and we use a Buck Institute modified rubric. Uh, next slide. Or you can create a custom rubric. So that's really easy to, next slide, actually build your own and then share it. You can make it public. Uh, next slide. We support a lot of project content. So the nice thing about the platform is that we allow you to take in um, content from the web. So if you've created something in another website, that's great. You can use your camera to grab content. 
video camera or a regular still camera. You can use your camera roll for anything you've captured previously. You can use a whiteboard. So you actually have an annotation feature which can be a strict whiteboard, like kind of a Khan Academy style whiteboard, or take a picture of something and then annotate on top of it with audio. So it's kind of, you know, an explain everything slash show me slash whatever um, thing built in here. And it's not to replace those tools. This is just to help us kind of get you from having to app smash everything. Uh, as well as bringing in Dropbox and content. You can bring in content from any of those places. And uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. So this is a picture of our annotation feature. It's a pretty easy to use uh, tool that allows you to kind of change colors and text and font and draw and all sorts of stuff. Uh, next slide. Uh, skip, skip, keep going. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk quick over stuff. So there's a lot of feedback tools. Uh, these are some of the tools. This is how you get to the rubric. You can kind of see over here, this is the student would receive their project. They would get some feedback from the teacher. They can see the assignment which this originated from. They would see if there's a grade or a badge. And then, of course, the rubric that would have been selected with any of those things. Uh, next slide. Um, the feedback gets sent to parents in the way of progress reports. So if you go to the next slide, we have these digital progress reports where teachers can actually uh, create reports. Keep going. Re create reports for all their kids. Next slide. And then this is a kind of tracking the students' growth on their projects over time. So it does take a traditional grade approach and it blends it with the actual work. So, so teachers would get these progress reports and they would be able to see not only what did the student do, so the product, they would be able to see the assignment and the teacher could actually give sample work and stuff like that, uh, as well as see all the feedback. So the teachers are, or the parents are saying like, why'd you get a B? What does a B mean? Well, a B means this is the work that they did, this is the assignment that it stemmed from, or the project or origination question, and this is all the feedback that they got and how they did revisions over time, which is really very cool. Uh, keep going forward. And these, the, just skip that part about reports. So digital portfolios, I think, is really the other key thing, is like students do this work, and then they can create a portfolio over here. Next slide. They have ownership of how it works, how it looks and feels, and then they can add the different work that they've created, different projects that they've done. Keep going and skin it, and then they can kind of share that to their peers or to their teachers or to their parents. And then the nice thing about this is that it stays with them over time. We have all these different themes that kids can use. They love the Lego theme my kids personally do. Uh, next slide. And these portfolios stay with you over time, so they're not tied to a specific class or grade. If you're in third grade and you use this platform, you use it all the way to ninth grade, you still have the same portfolio that you could kind of edit around and change what you're showing but you could use it for college or whatnot. Um, more and more schools are doing that. And there's a public audience. So if you go forward over here, we have audience. I uh, showed you that before, so we could skip that. Comments, likes, shares, all that stuff is available to use. There's a parent portal, as I talked about before, where parents can kind of see not only what's coming up next, but the, the work product. Uh, keep going. We're going to skip a bunch. Keep going, keep going, getting started. So, so it's a free app. Uh, you can create an account. Districts or schools can create an account. Um, the, the address is bit.ly slash we learned it with a capital W, L, and I. Uh, keep going forward. And so again, you create the appropriate account for whatever your, your account type is. And go one more forward. When you're a teacher, you sign up your kids using a code. So we have a printout within the platform that prints out right from your iPad. You can send it to the printer or email it. And it sends a student a code as well as a corresponding parent code. And the parents would sign up, students would sign up. And this is kind of a la Edmodo or Remind. Um, they get this code, they go into the app, they can pull it in, and they can start accessing all of this. So go to the next slide. So it is a product that we've been charging for. However, I do want to say that if you are a future-ready school, you can actually get this completely for free through the end of next June. So the first year is completely gratis. Um, we do have people that, that are trialing it in schools all over the country, and that's totally great. But you know, feel free to start working on it. As the freemium product, you get a lot of, of free stuff. Um, so it's not like it's like, oh, you can't do anything with it. You can totally use it. Just one of the few things that, that you don't get are the rubrics uh, and progress reports in the parent portal. So those are the, the real premium features of there. So uh, let's, that, that, I'm kind of going to wrap it up there. Um, and, and let you know that I'm happy to answer questions elsewhere outside of here. That's not, so it's not a, the be all. Yeah. Oh, there yeah. was a question about can you use four point scale instead of letter grades for the progress over time feature? So we're actually adding that. 
it's, it's funny that you mentioned that. We, we heard from two other schools that they would like to do that instead. So we can do that as well. But but at the current moment, the answer is no. But but that will be added. Okay. And if you have well, questions about um, it, feel free to yeah. contact me. Right. You can you can tweet at him, Adam at at Adam Bello, um, or you can go to the websites and there's uh, there's forums on the different websites that you can you can uh, contact him. Or if you can't contact him and you want to contact us, uh, we we know how to get a hold of him. So we we can we can reach out and. Um, and you know, have him answer your questions, uh, but you should be able to reach him very easily because I mean, no, yeah, you I'm Google Adam sure. Bellow, he's all over the place. So, Adam, do you have anything you want to say to, to close out? Uh, it it was great to share. My first, I got to see Jeff do his uh, presentation before earlier today, and uh, you know, I've been talking about this with Mitch and Tom and Steve for a while, so. I, I really appreciate you having me on tonight, but I'm, I'm more excited about the people that I met here that are doing great things in their project, especially Edgar, who's, who's going to start this up next year in his whole school. Um, you know, keep doing it. So, Carissa, we have to check in with you next year and see if that project, you felt more comfortable, if the timing was right or whatever. I mean, that's the beauty of it, right? You start small, you keep going, and uh, I'm really excited to see so many people starting to move or, or continuing to move into the PBL direction, which is really exciting. So, thanks again. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, this is uh, Mitch Weisberg. I'm signing up for EdChat Interactive. I hope to see you all uh, next week uh, or the week after with, with one of our upcoming sessions. Uh, next week, uh, we have, oh, I guess, August 12th, we have Adam Bell repeating, who's going to be, and next week, Adam's going to be talking, or August 12th, Adam's going to be talking about design thinking. Um, so for, for right now, at 818 Eastern Time, uh, sorry that we kept you longer, but I guess you stayed because Adam was, as always, extremely interesting. Uh, and good night, and talk to you soon. Bye.